I've always enjoyed it. As uh, George said, back in the mid-80s, I was very fortunate to meet some of the last Scottish Gaelic speakers on PEI, and uh, fortunately I was able to record some of those people. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about, as George said, things like uh, the Banshee, the Irish Fairies, and Irish Wakes, and I subtitled the talk on the threshold of the Irish Otherworld. And this idea of being on the threshold is one thing I'll be talking about uh, throughout uh, the stories that I'll be mentioning. Um, the Otherworld was something that seemed to be very real to the Irish in centuries gone by, and yet it wasn't quite heaven, it wasn't quite hell, and it was just out there on the edge. And the word threshold is a word that may be very appropriate because when you're standing on the threshold, you're neither inside the house and you're not outside the house, but you're in that area that's just in between. And over the last few years, it's become popular for um, folklorists and also for uh, literary scholars to use a term which is... Um, comes from the Latin, it's called liminality, and we don't have to worry too much maybe about what the term is, but I thought I might mention the term. Liminality, it comes from the Latin word for the, for the threshold, for the doorstep, and we have it in some English words like subliminum, subliminum, subliminal and preliminary, and um, when, a bi when a bishop goes over to Rome, they call that an ad limina visit, and those all come from the Latin word for the threshold. And as I'm going through some of the stories about the little people, also known as the fairies, uh, also known as leprechauns, and I'll talk about that, I'd like from time to time to stop and think about what aspect of this liminality or threshold, this, the idea of being neither here or neither there. Uh, the fairies, in all the stories we have about them, they're not really devils, they're not really evil, and yet they're not really all that good either. They're somewhere in between. And so this is, as I say, this is something we'll be looking at, looking at as I go through some of the tales about them. The Irish were not the only group of people to have their beliefs in these other world creatures. Probably you've all heard of the leprechaun, but whether you turn to Scotland or even to England in ancient times, or to Scandinavia, all of these people seem to have had a belief in other world creatures. In Scandinavia, they call them Nyssa. In ancient England, they call them, uh, well, they use the term fairy, they use the term pixie. Uh, in Ireland and Scotland, the word that's used of these people is the she. It's an old Gaelic word, and so that's where we get, and I'll be talking later about the banshee. What the banshee means, literally, ban is the word for woman, and she is the word for the fairies. And if any of you have ever looked at the poetry of uh, the great Irish poet, for instance, W.B. Yeats, he talks a lot about the hosting of the she. Uh, this is the, the fairy host. And until recently, there were people in Ireland, and many of the Irish people left Ireland, who had a firm belief in the existence of these beings. Um, in fact, Yeats, at one point, Yeats was particularly interested in people who had these beliefs. You may know that Yeats was uh, very interested in the occult, and he, he was interested, he went to a number of seances, and he was always interested in meeting people who had some sort of a connection to that other world. And Yeats went around County Sligo and spoke to some of these um, people who had these beliefs. Uh, you can find in his book, Celtic Twilight. And uh, one interesting story that Yeats tells is about um, this man who was always telling stories about the fairies, as they were called. And he seemed to be a quite intelligent man. Uh, and Yeats said to him, do you believe in the fairies? And the man said to him, no, I don't believe in them. Not at all, not at all but they're there. <laughs> and this is sort of the, the kind of uh, Irish life in the old days seems to have been permeated by this belief. 
And many of the stories we have about these little people, which were firmly believed in, seem to tell, seem to show us, seem to give us a guideline about how we should go through life. Many of them don't have uh, exactly a direct moral, but you can draw inferences about how you should conduct yourself. And if you're able to conduct yourself in life and get through successfully in your dealings with these other world people, you'll probably do quite well in life. Um, one question about the origin of the fairies. Some people, some scholars think, well, maybe these are, uh, of course, Ireland underwent a number of invasions, and in ancient times it may have been the case that uh, the new group of invaders coming in would have met, met up some of these ancient people, so that may have given rise to the belief that there were fairies there. But the Irish people themselves, the, uh, the old Gaelic speakers, had this belief in the origin of the fairies. And it has to do with uh, the part of the stories from the Bible, when Lucifer and God were having their battle, God banished the, uh, the evil angels out of heaven, and the angels, the evil angels were, were falling out of heaven, and in fact so many were leaving heaven at that time that uh, Michael the archangel came up to God and said, ooh, wait a second, we have to do something about this. There are so many of them falling out of heaven. And so God just lowered his, his hand and said, let's stop at that. And instantly, all of those who had been falling out from heaven just stopped. Those who had made it down to hell, of course, those are the devils down there. Those who stayed up in heaven are the angels. But those who were sort of between hell and heaven, those are these fairy people. So there we have, again, that idea of they're neither, they're neither the, good, the good angels, they're not the bad angels, but they're somewhere in between. And also, because of this idea of things being on the edge, when are you most likely to meet the fairies? Well, not usually in broad daylight, possibly in the dark, but more than likely, it's at twilight or at dusk in the morning, or dawn in the morning. Just when we're going from the daytime into the nighttime. We're not yet, we have not yet left the daytime, we're not yet fully into the nighttime, and it's somewhere in between that we're likely to run into them. And in story after story, that's exactly when they show up. Um, let me tell you a story that was told to me I guess 22 years ago, I was in the west of Ireland, and the house I was staying in every day or two times a day was visited by an old fellow who uh, would come on a Cayley. Um, he lived in a little, what they called a caravan, a little trailer, and he had one story after the other about this other world, and he seemed to believe in the other world people. This particular story deals with a blacksmith. The blacksmith's name was Joe Lydon, and... Um, one evening, as Joe Lydon was just about to close up shop, a man came with his horse, and he said, I have quite a journey to make, and I'd like you to put some, some shoes, I'd like you to shoe the horse for me. And Joe Lydon said, well, it's kind of late at night, and uh, you know, I really close down the shop at around 6 o'clock. I don't like to keep it open too late, especially on Saturday night. Saturday night, tonight, Saturday night, uh, the man said, well, I really would appreciate it if you could do this for me. I have quite a journey to make. So against his better judgment, Joe Lydon started to shoe the horse. He took up the first, the first uh, hoof, put a shoe on. Took up the second hoof, put a shoe on. Took up the third hoof, put a shoe on. He started looking for the fourth leg, <laughs> and the horse didn't have a fourth leg. <laughs> Well, Joe Lydon being a blacksmith, and all blacksmiths have, they know what they're doing. He didn't say anything. He just looked at the fellow he was dealing with. And the fellow said to him at that point, how are the potatoes here this year? And Joe said, uh, they're quite good. They're quite good. And the fellow said, well, where I come from, the potatoes were very bad, but the wheat is good. And he left. He paid, paid Joe and left. Now, 
The story doesn't tell us that that man was from the other world, but we have to pick up the clues. First of all, it happened kind of late at night when we're moving into, into the, uh, the twilight. And the obvious thing that gives it away is the horse only had three legs. So you just have to kind of, this is the, and the fellow who told me this did not fill me in on all the details. I was waiting for more details, but you know, to him, it was just obvious. Um, also, about 10 years ago, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to meet in Portland, Maine, a man from the west of Ireland who had spent something like 30, 40, let's see, probably 50 years in Portland, Maine. He was an old Irish speaker, and he's one of the few people I've ever heard tell me that he believed in the fairies. My friend and I were videotaping him, and he had just told us a story. Let me tell you the story, actually. <laughs> I'll get just a sip of water. He had just told us this story, which some of you may know, about the, uh, the fairy people. It turns out that this one fellow who lived in a village had a hump on his back. And on this particular day, he went out for a walk. And as he was going down by the, what they call the fairy fort, he heard this music. It was going, Je Luen de Mart, Je Luen de Mart, Je Luen de Mart, which is Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday. And finally, he yelled out, which is Wednesday. So the fairies tried it. They said, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They thought it was fantastic. They came out, they grabbed him, and they said to him, uh, thanks for fixing our song. You've done a great job. What can we do for you? So what they did was to take the hump off his back. So this fellow went home, straight as could be, but he just happened to live next to another man who had a hump on his back. And this fellow was sort of a grouchy old fellow, but he, when he heard this story, he said, I'll go out to the same place. And he did this. The next day, he went out to the same place. And he heard them saying, and so on. It's a beautiful tune. What does he do? He yells out, August, and Thursday. So they tried that. Ruined the song. So they came out, they grabbed him, and they said, you've ruined our song. So um, they said, well, you know what we're going to do to you? We have this extra hump lying around here. <laughs> and they took that hump and put it on his back, and the poor fellow went home with two humps on his back. Uh, now, what does that story illustrate? Well, it illustrates to be careful when you're dealing with the fairies. <laughs> uh, some people, when they tell that story, say he was so humped over that, and he had a long nose, that uh, when he was going home, his nose hit the ground. And that's how the first plow was invented. <laughs> <laughs> but the man I was talking about a moment ago, Pat Malone, told that story, except his version was slightly different. He had a woman with a baby singing the song, and she's the one instead of the fairies. So I asked him at the, after he told it, because he hadn't mentioned the fairies at all, I said to him, and who was, who was that woman in the story? And we were speaking Irish, and he said to me, Banshee, a fairy woman. And uh, then he turned, in, he turned to English, and he spoke to me and the fellow who was filming. And see if you can follow, he has a very thick Irish accent, and he also throws in quite a lot of Irish Gaelic words. But this is Pat Malone, the late Pat Malone, and uh, he recounts here exactly the kind of story Yeats would have been thrilled and, and was thrilled whenever he heard anyone tell. Pat Malone reminiscing, I don't know, if, I, don't, I can't vouch for the, for the truthfulness of it. He was a great storyteller. He could just instantly come out with things, but see if you can follow what he says. Yeah, 
demnach uh, I was only three years old, he says, when I saw a fairy on St. Martin's night. Now he goes into English. Well, that's just to give you an idea. He uh, basically stops it there and says he called to his parents and told them, but they didn't pay any attention to him, so everyone went in and went to bed, and, and that, was, that was it. But it was kind of interesting that what he said to us, after telling that other story, he turned to us and said, I don't, you probably heard that, uh, the two of you, ye don't believe in the fairies. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't believe in the fairies, <laughs> but, uh, well, um, there are many, many stories, and as I said, some of them sort of give you um, oh, maybe the way the Irish felt you should lead your life. There's one interesting one, which uh, fits in perfectly with an Irish proverb. The Irish proverb goes like this, Inishkeil abroron cumdeg nubimo. And this refers to, um, in the old days, when people would visit each other's house, it was expected that, you know, you just wouldn't go there and sit like a lump on a log. You'd be able to do something. And this proverb says, Inishkeil, tell a story. Abar Ora, sing a song. Kumdeg, make up a lie. <laughs> or get outside. <laughs> and there's quite an interesting story that illustrates this. It uh, has to do with a man named Rory O'Donoghue. And uh, this fellow, Rory O'Donoghue, uh, had a wife who knitted stockings. And he, his job was to take the stockings, whatever she knitted, and go around selling them. And he might have to go miles and miles to different towns. And on this particular night, he didn't get back home in time. So it was getting kind of late at night. OK, there we have you know, the idea that that's the time you have to be careful. Uh, in the dusk and so on, and he came to a house, walked in, knocked on the door, walked in. There's a man in the house, and he said, uh, he, he said, uh, hello, Rory O'Donoghue. Now, there's one of the first clues. Rory O'Donoghue didn't know him, but here's one of the clues. This man knew who he was. He said, sit down. Uh, are you hungry? Have a bite to eat. So he gave him a mug of tea. He gave him a bite to eat, and... Uh, he said to him then, well, Rory, how do you feel? And Rory said, I feel fine. And then he said, the man said to him, tell me a story. And Rory said, I don't have a story. Well, sing a song. 
Roy said, I I've never sung a song. <laughs> so the fellow said, get out. <laughs> and so Rory went out and uh, he grabbed his, his pack, you know, with the stockings in it. And he was a little confused, I suppose. It was pitch black out. And he's walking along and uh, he's, he thinks he sees a fire. And uh, there are two men by the fire and they call to him. And they say, Rory O'Donoghue, come over here and help us. And he approaches the fire, and what, what it is, there's a, uh, like a spit over the fire with a piece of meat on it, and the two men are turning the spit. And, and they, they call, and they say, Rory O'Donoghue, come over here and help us turn the spit. Well, right away he should realize when they're calling him by name, they're from the other world, they know who he is again. And so, sure enough, he helps them. He, he says, yes, I'll, I'll help you. And uh, they run away, they leave him alone. And as he's turning it, he realized that the piece of meat that's on the spit is a person. And just as he realized that, the person says, Rory O'Donoghue, turn me around, I'm, I'm being burned on this side. And so uh, he runs off. Uh, he's so frightened. And uh, he ends up finding his way back to the house that he had just been in. And he knocks on the door, and he's you know, so frightened. And he, he, the, man, the man says, oh, it's you. Well, do you have a story to tell? And <laughs> I mean, it's actually quite long. It's a, a long, long story. Many other things happened to him. But from that day on, Rory O'Donoghue has a story to tell. The, and do you see what I'm saying? You sort of get a little bit of a lesson out of some of these tales. You should always, it gives you a way to go through life. You always should be prepared. Um, now. Again, on this idea of liminality of being on the threshold, there are certain people who are more susceptible to being taken by the fairies. Children, especially unbaptized children, had to be carefully watched. Because of this, there was a custom of putting iron in with the baby, or various other things, like a cross. And this was believed it would keep the fairies away, because the fairies were never quite sure where they fit into the whole uh, religious thing. They were sort of not uh, too sure. They're always afraid of priests and religion and so on. Um, not only babies were in trouble, but uh, women who were about to be married were in uh, trouble as well. And there are many stories about the fairies, uh, certain fairies trying to get a woman who's about to be married. One of these um, takes place. Uh, another, another thing that's, that occurs in this story is they need sometimes someone from, from the real world to go along on their escapades and help them. And on this particular occasion, they do get a man to come along with them. And they go to a house where a woman is celebrating with, there's a big party going on, it's an engagement party, she's about to be married. And the old fellow, uh, well, it's the fairy who's 1,500 years in this story, uh, has the human fellow with him. And they sit up on the rafters and they see the party that's going on below. And the old, the old fairy gentleman is saying that he wants to marry that woman who's celebrating her engagement party. And uh, the human fellow is with him, doesn't know what to do. But the fairy says, you wait and see, I'm going to get her tonight. And so uh, as they're dancing around below them, the fairy has some pepper. And he drops some pepper down right onto right by the nose of the young lady, and she sneezes. And because of all the music and all the dancing, nobody says, Dialin, God with us, which is what you say in Irish when you sneeze. Well, the fairy says, aha, that's one, two more, and she's mine. When they go around again, he drops some more pepper down, and the young lady sneezes. Nobody says, Dialin, or God bless us. Aha, he says, one more time. So just at that, he drops, uh, she dances around again, and he drops the pepper down. And the fellow who's with him can't stand it. He just doesn't like the idea. So she sneezes, and he yells out, Dear Agus Mwidili, God and Mary with us. And this, <laughs> this is anathema to the, to the old fairy fellow. And uh, he pushes the human fellow, and he falls down in the rafters. But the important thing is that he saved the young lady. They don't know where he's come from. He has to, he has to explain the whole story. But uh, it's another example of how a woman in that 
She saw, why, how is that liminal, or how is that the threshold? Well, she's about to leave her single state and become a married woman. So she's someone who's, who's engaged is just in that sort of threshold territory. And the same was true for women just after childbirth, until they had been churched. Churched is uh, an old uh, expression for they would, pe people, women who had uh, children used to go to the church some six weeks after having a child and they'd get a special blessing. So a woman in those few weeks there is also likely to be uh, taken by the fair. She's in kind of dangerous territory. And of course, as I was saying about newly born children, they were especially susceptible. Mm -hmm. And there are many stories of those, those infant babies being taken by the fairies and replaced by a wizened old fairy child and you may have know, you may know the term, they call those changelings. And there are some funny stories about these. But there are some sad stories because it's apparently true that as late as the 1840s, a woman threw her own child into a fire in County Tipperary, thinking it was a changeling. So there, there is a sad side to that. But some of the stories are quite funny. There's one about this uh, changeling that was in the cradle, and they didn't know what to do with him. No matter what they did, they couldn't, couldn't seem to satisfy him. And uh, he was always crying. And on this one occasion, they, they went to a wise woman in the neighborhood who advised them what to do. And the woman said, make a brewery of eggshells. And what she did was to take eggshells, go, go by the fire, and she was just sort of playing with the eggshells back and forth. No one else was in the house except the baby. And you can just picture this, this wizened old child looking up over the side of the cradle saying, Mommy, what's that you're doing? You know? <laughs> and uh, she says, I'm making a brewery of eggshells. And this little thing says, well, I've been in the world for 1,500 years and I've never seen that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then she knows exactly what he was. And so she threatens it then with the hot tongues from the fire. And as soon as she's about to stick it through, he disappears and her own sweet, loving baby is returned. But people believed that these were some of the dangers that they were up against. And in connection with this, the Irish language until the present day has what's almost like a ritual. I mentioned it there for the, when you sneeze, we do that sometimes in English, we say, God bless you, or something like that. In Irish, there's a whole series of ritualistic um, expressions. When you meet someone in Irish, you say, Diorit, which is God to you. And the person responds to you, Diosmurit, God and Mary to you. And it's like, by doing that, you sort of know that that person is, you know, of this world. Whenever you, in an Irish speaking district, if you see someone uh, nearby working in the fields, when you pass, you're supposed to say, Balu Yort, the prosperity from God on you. And by saying that, it shows that you're not one of these people from the other world. You, you know the ritual, and you're using the right ritualistic terms. This is also true in the case of, until recently, when people still had their own cows and milked their own cows. And if they ever gave you a glass of what they call in Ireland, new milk, that's fresh milk from the cow, you were expected to know that you were supposed to say, God bless the cow. Uh, they had all of these sayings they would use, and that's one that was particularly important because the cows and the, the milk and the butter were precious to the people. And they were especially afraid of people who might take that away from them. And the closest thing the Irish have really to witches would be women who were accused of taking away what they called the profit of the cow, in other words, the milk or the, or the butter. And they have many stories about some of these old, the Irish word for these women is kayach, um, going out into the field in the form of a hare or a rabbit and actually taking the milk from the cow. Uh, in some cases then, what what would have to be done is you'd have to go after them with the hounds. The hound would sometimes catch the hare, just about catch it, and the hare would run off to a house of a neighbor who happened to be the, this woman they thought it was, 
and by the time the men got to the house, the woman would be there at the fire with her side bleeding because the dogs had torn her up. Uh, many stories told along those lines. Um, let me move on to a slightly different character. I've been talking about this uh, fairy host. There is one particular one which is probably quite well known to most of, you, most of you, and that's the leprechaun. And the leprechaun is usually pictured as being a solitary figure. He's, uh, he's the one who's the shoemaker. Uh, the name leprechaun, we know, goes back at least a thousand years. We have one story from Old Irish uh, which uses the term. And in fact, this particular story is very much like, like um, Gulliver's Travels. You have the little people in a kingdom, and then you have uh, the big people in another kingdom. Uh, and the word leprechaun is used in that. What they think the word comes from, leprechaun, they think it comes from uh, a switching around of the letters from the word lukopon, which would mean little body. We're not sure, but that that's what we think it, it means. My favorite story dealing with the leprechauns, you all probably know what it is the leprechauns have buried, pot, pot of gold, and that is, that is an authentic belief. And of course, if you can catch the leprechaun and handle the situation properly and just right, you might get the pot of gold, but I don't know of any story in which that happens. Uh, but the most famous of these stories it involves what they call Bukhawan Bui is the Irish for yellow ragweed. And this particular fellow comes upon the leprechaun, he grabs him, and he says, ha ha, give me the pot of gold. And the leprechaun is quite cool, calm, and collected and says, yes, I'll, you, you can have it. He says, do you see that uh, Bukhawan Bui, that, that yellow ragweed growing over there? The fellow says, yes. He says, the pot of gold is under it, six feet under. The fellow says, great, fine. He lets go of the leprechaun, goes home, gets a shovel, comes back to the field, and there are 100,000 rag ragweeds growing in the field. <laughs> and so, although he started to dig, they tell me he's still digging. He hasn't found the pot of gold. Well, I mentioned a moment ago the women who were sometimes thought as stealing the butter and the, uh, the, the milk. And one particular aspect of the fairy women is the word which you're all probably familiar with, ban-she. And the word ban is just the Irish word for woman. She is the fairies. So ban-she is a woman of the fairies. But the well-known banshee is quite different in many ways from the other people we've just been talking about because she has this special role. In fact, it's a word, most of you have probably heard it in English. She was crying like a banshee or the howl of the banshee and so on. And in fact, uh, that uh, role of the banshee is known throughout Ireland. It was, there were several other names used for her, including one in the south of Ireland, she was sometimes called a baib, which is a word that takes us back at least a thousand years. Uh, she was called also a banchinte, which is a keening woman. In other words, a woman who laments. And basically what banshee did was to shout and wail. And in doing this, she was uh, giving like an omen that death was about to approach. Now, some people believe she only did this for certain families. Some of the families were the families with O in their name or Mac in their name, but there's evidence that uh, she actually would call out for other families as well. They, have some, they had something similar in Scotland, although it doesn't seem to have been, we have only traces of it, it may not have been quite as well developed. The Scottish seem to have gone more in for what they called the washerwoman and the washerwoman in Scottish tradition, and we have a trace of this in Irish tradition as well, was uh, a woman who would be seen at the side of a river washing clothing, and the clothing she was washing were the blood-stained clothing of the men who were about to die in battle. But the Irish, the typical Irish uh, banshee is the one who shouts, and the descriptions of her shout or her scream or her screech 
uh, well, it's, it's, it's a shrill screech, and we have many descriptions of people who claim to have seen her. She's usually pictured as being an older woman, uh, hunched down on her haunches, as they say, sort of in a crouching position, with streelish hair, hair coming all the way down. In fact, some descriptions say it came all the way down onto the floor around her. Uh, she's sometimes pictured as wearing black, green, or white, like a cloak. Sometimes it says it's like a sheet that was just thrown over her. Um, as far as the origin, what the people believe the origin was, some people say, well, the name tells us, Banshee, she must come from the fairies. Other be people believe that she was one of the keening women. In other words, a woman who in her lifetime at funerals and wakes would uh, lament over the corpse. Another belief is that she was a condemned woman, someone who, a woman who had done something bad in her life. And a further belief was that she was an unbaptized child. So you can see in some of these, again, that idea of people who are sort of in what they call liminal position on the threshold, not quite uh, one way or the other. Now, the Banshee has been heard throughout Ireland, as I said, but also a number of Irish emigrants who've left Ireland claim to have heard the Banshee in North America, and when they heard it, they knew that someone in their family had died. And this idea of some sort of a portent or an omen is found in many many cultures, but it seems the Irish particularly have this belief in the banshee is the one. In Scottish tradition, it's fairly common to hear a little comet going by, which uh, indicates that someone has died, and there are many other omens that, that tell about that. Now, I thought I'd move then from the banshee to the actual keening women and talk a little bit about just what the keening women were. The Irish word to cry is keen, and that's where we get that meaning, keen. And at, in the old days, at wakes and funerals, there were women who were actually hired to keen over the corpse. The family had, obviously, many other things to do, and so they would get these women come, <laughs> come uh, over, and for a few drinks, usually, and for a small fee, they would do the crying for the family. Now, I have uh, a short clip about a w from a, an elderly woman, um, Mrs. O'Keefe, who uh, left Ireland in 1910, I believe. I recorded her about 10 years ago. She lived the rest of her life in Massachusetts. And the thing about Mrs. O'Keefe was she was able, in a few words, she had never studied in the university. Uh, she had spent most of her life working as a domestic, and she was married and had many children. But she was able, in a few words, to sum up the essential points of whatever the topic was that she was discussing. She would have been a great lecturer. Um, it, it will take me just a minute to go back to the spot, but I'd like you to listen to Ms. Mrs. O'Keefe for a moment. Mrs. O'Keefe was from the west of County Kerry, and she was, not, she was not a native Irish speaker, but she had grown up partially with her grandmother, who spoke Irish. Her grandmother spoke Irish to her, but she answered her in English all the time. So she had a fair amount of Irish, but she was not a native Irish speaker. Oh, 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 oh. 
talks about the, uh, the practice of keening in Ireland, and uh, it's in Irish. Mrs. O'Keefe never read it, but she summarizes exactly everything they have to say in that short piece that she did there. Uh, the insincerity, uh, one, the church naturally was against this custom because, largely because of its insincerity. Uh, also, it was obviously a pagan custom just as what we've been talking about, most of what we've been talking about, obviously pagan customs that actually predate Christianity. Go back before that, when you consider the, the date for Christianity coming to Ireland, St. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland, usually the date given is 432. These customs were hard dying. They lasted right up until this century, as you can see. And I'd like to say a few words. Uh, I think the last, the last thing I'll talk about then is the wake, the Irish wake. We're obviously getting into that. And uh, wakes nowadays for most of us seem, seem to be, and indeed are, sad events. But uh, perhaps they needn't be that, especially if we look at the old Irish wakes. And Mrs. O'Keefe was referring to that partially. Um, and there's a, a very good book on Irish wakes. I have it here. It's by Sean O'Sullivan, and the title of the book is Irish Wake Amusements. And this, I mean, this is, um, he wrote it in Irish originally, but let me read you a bit of the beginning of the book. He uh, was from County Kerry, and the area where he was from, Sean O'Sullivan, they did not have what you might call the wild Irish wakes. Obviously, they would have at some point, but this changed, and it has changed throughout all of Ireland now. 
But in 1921, when he was a student in County Mayo, which is the west of Ireland, and kept many of the old customs, there was a death in the neighborhood. And as was the custom, everyone was invited to go to the, to the wake. And he describes in, in his introduction, the first two pages, what it was like. And he says they all went into the house. These were students. They must have been about 18 years old. They were uh, preparatory school. And uh, a corner was made for them in the kitchen. They were given a clay pipe filled with tobacco. And they accepted the pipes, even though they were not really used to smoking at that point. And they said the proper things. May God have mercy on the souls of the dead. And they attempted to light the pipes out of respect for the deceased, but only in a half-hearted way since they weren't smokers. He says, within a short time, the house became more crowded than ever, more people arriving than leaving. As far as I can now recall, no other room except the kitchen was in use for the occasion. Tobacco smoke pervaded the whole place, and everybody was perspiring as the night was close and heavy. Conversation went on in both English and Irish, and current topics were discussed. At this point, there entered a local man who was well known to all present. He was a rather simple fellow, poor and harmless, and had never worn shoes. He was the butt of many jokes on the part of some of the locals, but they still had a concealed liking for him. On this occasion, he was barefoot as usual, and his hair was long and shaggy. He knelt down beside the corpse and recited an Our Father and Hail Mary out loud, his arms extended towards the bed. The kitchen felt silent as the people listened to him pray. As he was about to get to his feet, the prayer over, a fellow who was near me in the corner called, Say them again, John. The simple fellow went down on his knees again and repeated the same prayers out loud. By this time, titters of laughter were breaking out among the crowd. Someone yelled out, I wouldn't doubt you, John. Say them again. While poor John was reciting the prayers for the third time, laughter and amusement had spread through the kitchen. Over a period of ten minutes, he said the prayer six or seven times until he was finally allowed to rise to his feet and make his way to a seat in the corner. The wake had become much more lively by this time. There was a good deal of laughter. Young lads began to push each other. A few of them happened to be sitting on a sack of potatoes at the bottom of the kitchen, and at one point a large potato was thrown at a man who had bent down to talk to somebody else. He wheeled around but couldn't detect the culture. Then the potato throwing became general. Uh, horse play became the order of the night. And he says that I had never experienced a wake like this in my home county in Kerry. In his particular region, this kind of wake had died out. But he goes on to say then that uh, the next day at school, they left the wake around that time because they were students, they were studying. Uh, they believed they should get home and do their studies. But they were told the next day that they had missed the, the best fun. They had missed the best part of the wake. And O'Sullivan said, um, after that, he asked many people that he knew about the wakes in their areas. And almost universally, wakes of this kind were described to him. What surprised him about this one is that the relatives of the dead person did nothing to stop the horse play, and in fact, just continued about their business as, uh, you know, talking to people, but they made no attempt to stop the goings-on. And the more Sean O'Sullivan later years talked to people, he found out this was indeed the traditional Irish wake. And this is the most complete, complete study on it. He lists over 40 different games that were played at wakes. Some of these, uh, well, the saying was in Ireland for many years that a wake was better than a wedding for courting, and this kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> that many marriages, uh, many weddings actually came from, derived from wakes. Uh, he goes on to describe games that are similar to post office, uh, and e even some games which are uh, quite, quite racy, one called Frumso Framso, which uh, Irish bishops railed against for about three centuries, and yet it continued to be played in Irish wake houses. Not only games, uh, well, they played cards. What else should be at an Irish wake? Well, you heard, you had mentioned there of tobacco. The year I spent in Ireland, about 20 years ago, I, I went to one wake in the village, and what they had when you walked in were plates of cigarettes, 
everyone was, ex and also plates of tobacco, since many people were still smoking tobacco. You were actually expected to take a cigarette and light it, and you're supposed to say, as they said there, uh, God, God's mercy on the souls of the dead. Um, not only that, everyone who visited the house that I went to, and uh, this, this was the custom, should get something to eat and something to drink. And in the old days, when they didn't have much beer, what they did have in the countryside in Ireland was uh, people who made whiskey and people who made what we might call shine. Mm -hmm. um, in Ireland, it's called putty. And there's, the, uh, there's no doubt that people did drink too much. And he points out that the small, the small thatched cabins, uh, there was no good va ventilation, so people did tend to get fairly drunk. Other things that were done were um, the corpse, in some cases, was given, if everyone was taking, having a pipe, the corpse would be given a pipe, and they would make an attempt to light his pipe. <laughs> you may have heard this sort of thing and, and, and wondered, say, no, this can't be so, but according to this book, uh, it, it is. Not only that, they sometimes gave the corpse a drink, and in playing cards, he was sometimes included in the card game. <laughs> Also, there was singing and dancing, and the corpse was taken out <laughs> to dance with. Now, these are some of the things. Now, Sean O'Sullivan is, is one of the most respected Irish folklorists. In this book, there's, he, is, you know, he is Irish himself, He's obviously not trying to um, belittle the Irish custom. In fact, he, I think he explains well in the beginning how he found it so interesting how such a custom could exist. And he's at pains in the book to show that although this lasted longer in Ireland than in any other Western country, he shows that there were similar customs in Scotland, there were similar customs in Norway, all throughout Scandinavia, in fact. Um, but as well with the Reformation coming into certain countries, this put a definite damper on these things. Also in Ireland, the Catholic clergy for centuries was trying to put an end to these customs, and they, they finally did in this century. But the main question that uh, O'Sullivan asks is, how can we understand these wakes, especially now, he says, uh, in Christian times, how can we deal with these wild, pagan customs and the, he comes up with the following attempt at an explanation. Of course, he asked, he asked people what was their explanation. And they had things like, well, this kind of a wake was an attempt to uh, take the mind of the people who had just suffered the loss, take, get their mind off things. But he, uh, he thinks he has maybe a better solution, which comes from um, the fact that in ancient times, one of the great fears people had, of course, was of death. They didn't know how to deal with it. And, of course, also, when someone did pass on into death, there was the fear of ghosts, the fear that that person would come back. And he believes, and others apparently agree, that the wake was not done for the people who were visiting or the people of the house who were still living, that the wake was actually the last attempt at making the corpse feel like one of the community. And if you look at it from that point of view, it's not sacrilegious, perhaps, to include him in all of these things, to give him some food, to give him a pipe. Of course, there may have been excesses that was taken to excess in some case. But this is the explanation that Sean O'Sullivan comes in, that this last period, and again, we can look at it as one of those liminal periods, right? Because He's not yet gone. He's still with us, even though he's not in the same condition that we're in. And it's sort of an attempt to convince this, this corpse that he's still with us, that we still like him, we want to be good to him, and also, when he goes on and leaves us for good, that he won't come back <laughs> and cause us a problem. So that's, uh, well, that's a little bit about 
the wake custom. And I'm just going to end with the word then about ghosts. Because that fear of having the ghost come back is in fact what so many ghost stories are about. In one ghost story after the other, whether they're Irish or Scottish or what have you, the ghost shows up because something has been left undone. Something in his life hasn't gone wrong and it's bothering him or her in the next life. And so that's the reason the ghost comes back and tries to, tries to communicate with someone who can set things right. And if that is done, then that ghost can lay at rest. Well, I think I'll stop there. Um, if uh, you have any questions, I'll try my best to uh, give you an answer. <laughs> believe in them at all, but they're there. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> the toes, although I think I have heard that too. What I, what I remember, and this was actually done in many places, of course, was putting uh, a, a rope around the head so that the mouth wouldn't come open. I mean, when rigor mortis set in so that the mouth wouldn't open. And what, he, what Sean O'Sullivan mentions is that uh, the bodies were tied down, uh, especially in the case where they died sitting down. And then, uh, so they'd be sort of flattened and, and roped down so that they wouldn't spring up. But then always, always some wise guy would come along and cut the rope at just the right moment. <laughs> and the corpse, the corpse would spring up. But I'm, I'm not sure about the toes. It's I think uh, in that book, uh, Trinity Kelly Larkins, uh, it's the hurry. Puka. I meant to mention the puka. The puka is another one of these creatures. Um, what it's similar to, and the, may come from the same word, is like a spook. It's often pictured in Irish tradition as being a horse. And uh, the stories about the puka are that it sometimes lies peacefully and almost hidden in the dusk in a field. And if you're unfortunate enough to stumble over it, it and of course, at dusk, you might not see it properly. And that's the time, of course, that we have to watch out for. Uh, the, the pupa will rise up with you on its back and will run as fast as it can to the edge of a cliff where it will stop in its tracks <coughs> and let you go. That's one kind of story about the pupa, but there are many, many others. The word pupa is found throughout the place names of Ireland. Um, and it's, it's sort of like the basic Irish word for hobgoblin. So that there's even a proverb in Irish, uh, which I first learned after someone saw my scrawl. And the proverb, the proverb goes like this. Uh, uh, the thing that the puka writes, only he can read himself. <laughs> so it's, it's like a word for a, a hobgoblin or something. And uh, ghost comes close, but it's not quite ghost. It's more of a, a spook comes to mind. Yes? Can you tell us your favorite ghost story? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just basically, it's, it's one where someone has left something undone. I mean, that's a very, I, I really, uh, they, they all involve someone uh, having left a bill unpaid or something along those lines. 
sorry I can't it, it's just not coming to, to me now The Irish alphabet, um, well, in the old days, they, they had a different way, a slightly different way of writing it, sort of the way the Germans have a German script, but it is the same letters, A, B, C, D, and so on. It's just that in the old days, they had a much more ornate way of writing it. When you spoke of the waking, you talked about uh, the pipe and the brain person over being blue. Um, what, I, what I've read about the wakes is that the wildness, the wild side of them, was not, that did not happen in the case of tragic deaths. That's, Sean O'Sullivan says that, and, and that's what everyone has told me. If there was someone very young who died tragically, the wake would be much quieter. Um, in, in other words, it was usually when someone who someone quite elderly had died, but, and especially someone who had no close, close connections, then the, the wake tended to be much wilder. Um, and along those lines, I, I can think about a, there's a, a, a writer who writes detective stories based in Ireland. Some of you may have read, there's a detective, Megar, something like that. And as long as the fellow has them set in Dublin, they seem to work just right. But one of the stories, he, he, he wandered off to the west of County Clare. This is supposed to be the 1970s in County Clare. And in it, he has an Irish wake, a wild Irish wake for a young woman of 25 who had died. And he just misses, he doesn't get, in the countryside nowadays, that just doesn't happen, especially in the case of someone so young. They wouldn't have had that. But as far as the Irish wakes, I, I know they existed. The wake I went to in, in Connemara was not a wild Irish wake, even though the person who died was an elderly person. But uh, other people have told me that up until the 60s, wakes of this kind still existed with wake games in Connemara. So that would be the area where Pat Malone came from originally. Into the 1960s, in areas like, uh, well, Carrero in Connemara. But all of that's gone. Uh, plus also, of course, the stories about the fairies are disappearing. The old fellow who used to come in and see me when I was uh, staying in the west of Ireland, at night when he would throw out dirty water from his caravan, he would always say, Hoogie, hoogie, and tishka salaf and tishka ninafati. Uh, watch out, watch out the dirty water, the water that washed the potatoes. And I said to him, you know, why do you say that? He said, you wouldn't want to hit them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you know, I don't think there's, I don't think there are any young people who believe them. Although there are areas uh, in the world, apparently, some, one researcher in Newfoundland has found people who have quite a lot of fair stories, and they would have been here in any place where the Irish came a few generations back. There would have been tales like this. I don't know if any have continued to the present time in PEI. Maybe, among, the, maybe the ghost stories have. Among the older people in Ireland today, but just to tie in with what they're saying, yeah. now, among the older people, say, in the countryside now, would the belief in these legends still be pretty widespread, or is that starting to die out? The just starting to die out. There are, one thing I didn't talk about too much is, I mentioned the fairy fort and that kind of thing. There are certain spots that until recently, no one would dare to mess with. You know, it was believed this was a, a fairy fort, or things like the white thorn bush, or a black thorn bush. These have associations with the fairies. And there, there were places in Ireland until recently when the government was building a new road, all of a sudden there'd be a major curve in the road. <laughs> <laughs> because the local people said you cannot mess with this black thorn bush, that kind of thing. Or you can see fields in Ireland where the farmer's doing his uh, mowing, right? But in the middle, there might be some, one of these black thorn bushes. So people still have certain feelings about that kind of thing. And that's interesting from the point of view of, just think how ancient this belief must, must be. This obviously predates Christianity. This brings us back 1,600 years. And so it, it dies hard, but it is dying. Yes, Ireland is, the Ireland of today is far different. I was there 
for a year in 1972 to 1973. And I visited many summers after that. And every year you could see how it was changing. The people I stayed with in the West, um, when I went to stay with the, this couple, they said, well, we may not have meat every day, that kind of thing. They lived four miles from the nearest store, and they got there by bicycle. Now, you know, no, no one, few people use the bicycle the way they used to. Everyone tries to have a car. Just to supplement, yes. do you think the day will come when no, here all of those beliefs become obsolete that nobody will own what value know? That's, that's the way it's looking, but on, on the other hand, there are people now who are interested in looking into them and studying them and so on. But um, the question of, of belief, there are certain parts of them, and I think the ghost stories are still there, maybe beliefs in being careful about what, which trees or which bushes you knock down are still there. But the actual belief in the little people, I, I don't think so. No, no. In Brit in Brittany, the older people speak Breton, but they do not understand Irish or Scottish. But they do speak Breton. But there, they've they had all of these similar beliefs. But I, I would say they're even more modern there. And you can't you can't even find now in Brittany the, the Breton speakers. They can't even tell you these stories. They they just they they're all gone. But they had them. They had the story about Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday. That all of these tales. But um, Ireland and Scotland, the Irish and the Scottish, seem to have preserved these longer than anyone else. Maybe because they were out there on that edge of Western Europe. And uh, we're fortunate in the Maritimes that their descendants have preserved so much of these stories and the folklore.